thank you for the honor of this invitation as special guest of honor uh, at your 30th anniversary and reunion. And I must thank uh, my dear brother, uh, Mr. Okutepa, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, for reminding me that I'm only a small uh, vice president. I, <laughs> I agree, especially when compared to my illustrious predecessor, Dr. Alex Ekweme of blessed memory, a man whose exemplary life of humility and constant search for truth and knowledge has remained an important reference point for all serious holders of public office in Nigeria. The class of 1991 deserve every commendation for forming an alumni association. By definition, being active alumni uh, members means that one is a community-oriented person, one is altruistic and public-spirited. The reason is that alumni associations are about giving back and it's evident that the class of 91 is intent on doing just that, on giving back. And I'm told, and we've been informed that in another few minutes, awards and scholarships will be given to 30 uh, young men and women who at the moment are at the law school and who have some difficulty in paying their fees. Well done indeed. But let me assure you that every investment in a lawyer is a good investment. You know, these young men and women will very quickly, uh, as uh, Mr. Okutepa SAN has showed us, that it doesn't take so long to begin to wear designer suits. And uh, he has not said anything about the private jet, but uh, I think that we can also talk about that, you know. Uh, the tax people are not around today, Mr. Okutepa, so you can, we can feel free to talk, to talk about all these uh, wealth. Uh, Mr. Okutepa uh, reminded me of our encounter in, uh, um, in a case involving the present minister of Niger Delta Affairs. But my client at the time is the current uh, caretaker secretary of the APC, uh, Senator. Uh, let us just leave the uh, details of that matter. <laughs> just, to say, just to say that it was an interesting uh, encounter. Belonging to the legal profession is an incredible privilege. And um, I'm sure that all of us who are lawyers agree. Today, um, we're told that there are fewer than 150,000 lawyers dead or alive in Nigeria, or at least who qualified in Nigeria. Now, 150,000 compared to a population of uh, 200 million is certainly a very minute number indeed. And uh, these are men and women who are trained in the principles and concepts of laws in their applications to life from cradle to the grave. Every aspect of life is governed by law in one shape or form or the other. The theoretical and practical imperatives of social justice, rule of law, and all of these concepts that are meant to guard and guide our lives and guard our systems, we are the ones that are specially trained in the principles and the concepts of all uh, of these laws. The training a lawyer receives, at least in terms of practical relevance to human engagements at all levels, is second to none. I do not believe that there is any other profession that is meant to equip you for every aspect of life. Even medical doctors will agree that um, when a matter of uh, medical negligence comes to court, the lawyer is expected to be uh, the defender. And so many other ways, practically every aspect of human existence. There's a law or regulation on, on everything from birth to death. And the interesting thing is that people believe very strongly that lawyers know all of these laws 
people just assume that if you're a lawyer, you must know all of these laws, which is why, you know, you hear, and every one of us knows also that um, I'm sure that at various times, the moment people know you're a lawyer, they almost invariably either seek your legal opinion or something or the other. And it's a very special privilege indeed. I remember the story of a female relation of mine who met me at a family event uh, years ago. And the long and short of her story was that she was troubled about a particular issue. Her husband had taken a second wife, and she was married to him according to statute. She was married according to uh, English law. And the, what was worse was not just the fact that he had taken a second wife, but the fact that he had now decided, to, he had now said to her that she could no longer use his name. In other words, she was Mrs., let's just say Johnson, Mrs. Johnson. And her husband said, not only am I taking the second wife, but you cannot use my name anymore. Go back to your maiden name. And so she was terribly upset. And she asked me what my legal opinion, what my opinion was. Of course, knowing that I'm a lawyer, she expected that I would, you know, give an opinion that would be helpful. So I said, I explained to her that, yes, that um, clearly the man could not succeed in any court of law because nobody has a legal title to his name. If you are not a company, you are not a trade name, if your name is just your, you know, biological name, you don't have a title to it. So you can't stop anyone from bearing your name. In other words, somebody can even just decide tomorrow, from tomorrow, my name is Yemi Oshibajo. I can't argue. I can't say, why are you Yemi Oshibajo? If he uses my name for fraudulent purposes, that's a different matter. But I have no title to mine. So I explained all this to her. And she was quite happy about that, knowing, of course, that her husband would not succeed in court if uh, he were to take her to, uh, to a court and ask that the court declare that um, she was no longer able to use his name. But what then happened is, 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 is what I found most uh, striking. A short while after, about three months after, she sent me um, a WhatsApp uh, photo, a photograph on WhatsApp. And that photograph had a dog, obviously a dog. It had a collar. The dog had a collar with a name on it. I looked closely at the name. I expanded the photograph to look at the name. You know, and then I called. It was the name of a lady. So I called her back and said, ah, "What is this?" And she said, "No." She says, "Following my legal opinion, she has named her dog after her husband's second wife." <laughs> yeah. I, so at, at this point, at this point, I had to issue a proper disclaimer to say that uh, she never ever quote me. I was not the one who gave that advice. But people take us seriously. People take legal advice seriously. They take lawyers seriously. But the worst part of it, of course, as you know, is that most people, once they know any law at all, no matter how small their knowledge of the law is, they would usually just expand it in one shape or form or the other. I'm sure you've come across the expression many times. I hear it amongst politicians in particular. They start by saying, I'm not a lawyer, but they will now make one earth-shattering legal opinion after admitting that they are not lawyers. So I think that we are taken seriously as a profession and we owe society, we owe our society, we owe our nation a great deal of responsibility to ensure that we live up to all of the expectations uh, that that our society uh, confers upon us. Which brings me to the point that I'd like to emphasize for uh, purposes of this uh, short um, speech of mine. The urgent need to protect the integrity and sanctity of our system of administration of justice. The need for us, and I think it's an urgent need, for us to protect the sanctity and integrity of our system of administration of justice. This system of administration of justice is the basis for practically 
everything. It's the basis for commercial relations. It's the basis for governance. It's the basis for every interaction that we have, even uh, either as between individuals or as between, the st between individuals and authority of any kind, be it state or non-state. It is fundamental to everything that we do, our system of administration of justice. And we must protect its sanctity. And, and the reason why it's important for us to do so, there are two, at least two reasons. The first is a selfish reason. This profession is where we derive, many of us, our living, and also the prestige and recognition that society gives us. So we have a selfish interest to at least protect the system of administration of justice. But the second, and perhaps more important, is that this system of administration of justice is the basis for all of what we, we rely on in civilized society. Everything that we rely on is based on a system, a credible system of administration of justice. Unfortunately, uh, I'm sure many of us will agree about the inconvenient truth, to, to borrow that expression, that our, the integrity and sanctity of our administration of justice system is under serious assault, is under serious assault, and may well be in jeopardy. I think that many will agree that people are losing faith in the system of administration of justice that we run. Many people find, first of all, that there are too many delays. It possibly takes far too long to be able to get, especially if you are going through any of our legal processes, to begin a case and end it. Some would even say that our problem is not access to justice. It is exiting the, the system of justice once you get into it. So there's a huge problem of delays. And I was just sharing uh, with um, uh, Mr. Kutepa and some of our colleagues earlier before we came in here about a court of appeal case in the United Kingdom where uh, IPCO and NMPC, where the court of appeal in England, looking at a case where this, this was a, a, um, a, a Nigerian seated arbitration, and there was a concurrent case going on in, in Nigeria, in Lagos, and a case going on in the UK. The UK court was urged to suspend its own proceedings until conclusion of the case in Lagos. And counsel argued that no, if you suspend the case, if you for any reason hold the case, while you are waiting for the case in Lagos, it will take forever and a day. And one of the justices of the Supreme Court, now retired, gave expert evidence, a Nigerian justice of the Supreme Court, gave expert evidence in favor of the argument that the UK court should not delay the matter. And he said that it could take between 30 and 40 years to conclude the case in Nigeria. That's his justice of the Supreme Court who gave that expert opinion. So if a justice of the Supreme Court, and never mind whether or not that is even patriotic or right, could say that, then he must tell you something, that we are running a system that we are not even sure whether it is designed to produce the right results. The good thing is that every system is created by men and women, not by spirits. So if we want to repair it, we can repair it. When we wanted to repair the system, uh, especially for electoral matters, which will take, well, or many of those matters will take far too long, some three years, some four years, you know, while the tenure of the, of the person that you are trying to unseat is, is running. But we decided that, uh, and by law, that all of the proceedings will take 180 days. And that's exactly what has happened. So cases are concluded in 180 days. There's no reason whatsoever. Why by legislation, by regulation, we cannot control the length of time that it takes to decide cases. All of the solutions that we require for delays are solutions that are man-made because the problem is man-made. 
Delays do not make sense when they completely refute the very notion of justice itself. As they say, justice delayed is justice denied. So it is up to us to be able to say, no, 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 this is unacceptable. We must repair it. And I think that the, the, the role of, uh, of classes such as, uh, the, such as the alumni class of 91 is to constitute ourselves into powerful lobbies and advocacies for righting wrongs within the system. Because at the end of the day, this is our business, this is our profession. The second uh, issue is that of corruption, corruption within the legal system. Many of us, of course, know that this is becoming a major source of embarrassment a major source of embarrassment. And we know that this system, we know that this system is one that if we are not careful, we may come to the point where people will say it's better to know the judge than to know a good lawyer. And that is, that, 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 and that's a very worrying point. And I must say that most uh, of, of, of our judges, as you know, are decent human beings honest men and women of integrity. So are many of our lawyers. But it doesn't take uh, a crowd to completely discredit a system. A few dishonest judges, a few dishonest lawyers, it just is enough to completely discredit the system. And what we have seen is that constantly people are beginning to wonder whether or not uh, the system is one that is still capable of delivering fair and equitable justice, or whether it's one that's corrupted. So I think that there is a need for us to emphasize uh, and, to, and to be advocates, strong advocates, for repairing the damage to our system. Now, what, what, what can be done? What, 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 what are the steps, I think, that can, uh, that can be taken? The first is bold and relentless advocacy by we who are the stakeholders. I do not think that we need a whole crowd of people for reform purposes. Class, the class of 91 alone can take up the matter. Not even everyone in the class of 91. What is happening today is that there is no advocacy for change. There is none. Nothing is happening. There is no real advocacy for the kind of change that we want to see. Second is that we need to call out members of our profession who are uh, engaged in corrupt practices. We need to call them out. We need to, we, we need to ensure that we call them out, whether they are lawyers or judges, we need to call them out. And the third is that we need to significantly improve the remuneration of judges and, uh, of judges and magistrates. We need to significantly improve their remuneration. It doesn't make sense for a judge to wonder where they will live when they retire whether they would even be able to afford a home. Clearly, the salaries that judges and magistrates earn today cannot, uh, with any decent, um, uh, uh, be able, cannot pay for any kind of decent accommodation. Except, of course, there are in some states where uh, steps have been taken, Lagos, for example, and I'm sure a few other states, have taken steps to provide homes uh, for judges. But we need to be able to pay judges significantly better. There's no reason why the salaries of judges cannot be benchmarked against those of senators and House of Representatives members. No reason. So there's every reason for us to begin to look at what to do and in what ways we can improve uh, the uh, remuneration of judges. And I think it's uh, important that the Bar Association itself takes on this matter of discipline of, of members of the profession a bit more seriously than has been done at the moment. I recall uh, years ago, while I was Attorney General in Lagos, a gentleman who was practicing in England had, uh, came to me to write a reference for him. He needed a reference for, the, for uh, uh, a matter that was, that was before the Law Society in England. What had happened was that he had been uh, cited for misconduct by the Court of Appeal in England. And 
he was now appearing before the Law Society and needed you know, some reference from Nigeria to say that he was a man who had practiced law creditably in Nigeria and all that. But what was the reason for this uh, alleged misconduct against him? The man had taken a matter before the High Court in the United Kingdom, uh, a criminal matter, and took it on appeal. At the Court of Appeal, he was making a point uh, which the judges, the three justices of the Court of Appeal seated, considered was an unarguable position. And they hinted him that this point you are making is unarguable. It's just not a point you should be making. He continued making the point and argued and argued and argued after the hint. When he finished, uh, uh, the, of course, the court dismissed, uh, his, uh, he dismissed the appeal and then wrote to the Law Society that this man should be disciplined for pursuing an unarguable point after the justices had hinted him that the position was unarguable. That is something that is very unlikely here in Nigeria. Not only will people make unarguable positions, they will even file cases that are clearly without any merit. You know, and uh, 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 Mr. Kutepa just uh, pointed out a case to me where a man is on appeal, where a man went on appeal. He was not even a party in a case. And after judgment had been given, he said that his name was mentioned somewhere in the judgment. And so he had a right to appeal because he had not been given a fair hearing. And somehow in, 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 in the court, that was allowed. It was, it was actually allowed. Of course, the matter, uh, we hope, will go on further appeal. But isn't that just completely absurd? How does that even make sense? We all know that if you are not party to a matter, constitutionally you have no right of appeal or you cannot even seek leave to appeal. There's just no basis. How do we get to the point where a court would acknowledge that a man who has, who's just, as it were, you know, somebody mentioned, would say, I was not given a fair hearing. What sort of fair hearing are you entitled to? You're not a party, you're not a party. But I think that it's very important that we uh, continue to emphasize, and especially our laws, our, 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 the legal profession, the, the, the bar association. The bar association is supposed to protect this profession. And I'm sure uh, Ms. Odua is Mrs. Odua is listening to this. I mean, we, we have to find the means to tell ourselves that, look, if this crumbles, if this profession crumbles in our generation or in our time, we have only ourselves to blame. So I hope that um, we will uh, take some steps. By the way, the gentleman who uh, made the unarguable point, you know, uh, appeared before the law, law society three times, you know. Eventually he was given a reprimand, was allowed to continue to practice in the UK. But you can imagine that he never again dared to do uh, because he came this close to losing uh, his license. So uh, it's especially appropriate that this anniversary should be dedicated to the goodness of God in these 30 years, and that we're all alive and well, and that you're alive and well. 30 years post-call is more than enough reason uh, to praise and thank the Almighty God. And so I join you all in giving thanks and praise to God for the successes of these past years. And I pray for the class of 1991 that your successes today will be the very least that you would ever have in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. It's now my very special pleasure and privilege to officially declare open the 30th anniversary and reunion of the class of 1991. God bless you.